In this video lesson, we're going to take a look at the immune system and how it functions to keep us basically alive and to help prevent us from getting ill, or if we are become ill, how we can return back to health. So first of all, the role of our immune system is to pr protect us against pathogens. And a pathogen is an organism that causes disease. So they're normally species specific, but they can cross between species and that's known as zoonosis. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So some types of pathogens. First off, viruses, um, the flu, influenza, the cold virus, which is a rhinovirus, chicken pox, polio. Now we know COVID-19 being a virus. Um, all of these are viral pathogens. Then there's fungal pathogens, like athlete's foot and toenail fungus. These ones are a little bit harder to treat because um, most of our like antibiotics and so on, they can't attack viruses. They can attack bacteria, but that's it. Fungal infections are eukaryotic, or fungi are eukaryotic. So some of the, the methods for trying to kill a fungal infection could actually be harmful to us as well. So a lot of fungal treatments are actually topical. You put them on the, the fungus itself instead of ingesting them because there can be damage to your, your body by ingesting some of the fungal medications. Or there are side effects if you do have to take an internal fungal infection medication. Bacterial infections like E. coli, tuberculosis, botulism, and tetanus, they're all bacterial infections. Many of those can be treated with antibiotics, but as you learned last year, there is a rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria. We learned that in our evolution unit. Um, so that is concerning. So trying to find um, new antibiotics that are effective at killing bacterial infections is a common goal of um, scientists. Protozoa, so amoeba, malaria, are all protozoan um, driven pathogens. Flat room, worms such as flukes and planaria can cause disease. Uh, round worms such as threadworms can cause a condition known as elephantitis where um, the pathogen would block your lymph nodes and then you'd build up lymph and get swellings in your body. So airborne pathogens, those types of pathogens we breathe right into our lungs um, and there is a lot of debate right now about the transmission of COVID-19 because for the first, you know, year or more, it was said to be droplet based. So basically m maintaining a two meter distance and if you can't wear a mask would be the ways of protecting yourself. Um, but we're now realizing, or some scientists have been saying all along that some of the droplets are so tiny that they remain suspended in the air and we actually could breathe them into our lungs even after the person that expelled those droplets has left the area. So that is why the recommendation for wearing N95 masks and having proper air filtration has become a big focus in keeping our school safe and everyone safe. Waterborne pathogens. We drink contaminated water or other beverages and it enters into your intestines and then gets into your bloodstream and makes you sick. Foodborne, you eat the food and it enters into your intestines and then makes you ill. Insectborne, usually it could be a virus, a bacteria, even a protozoan carried by an insect. The pathogen gets injected into your bloodstream through a bite or a sting. Direct contact would be contact with someone's skin or saliva. So you're, you come in contact with the pathogen in some, some way, either by sharing a drink or somebody touching the surface and then you touching the surface and then getting onto you. Sexually transmitted, so oral, anal, or vaginal sex transmits those types of pathogens. So our body actually has three lines of defense to fight off invaders. The first two are non-specific, so they don't even care um, what invader it is. It just senses that there's an invader or an attempted invader and kind of blocks it off. The third line of defense is specific. 
and that is our immune system. So our first line of defense is made of our skin and our mucous membranes. So the mucous membranes are the linings of your nose, your eyes, um, your airways, and so on. So our skin secretions are acidic, and that goal is to ward off invaders. We also have enzymes in our tear, in our saliva. We have mucus and we have sweat that kill bacteria and other invaders. Mucus will trap invaders in our airways, and then the cilia that line our airways help sweep the invaders out of our respiratory tract. And then we also have acids in our stomach. Remember the pH of our, our, stomach, our stomach is around pH of two. So it kills off invaders that would get ingested. So sometimes you could eat contaminated food, but you still don't get sick because that first line of defense was successful. The second line of defense is when the first line of defense failed and an invader was successful in entering the body. And that line of defense is composed of your leukocytes or your white blood cells. And they engulf invaders and digest them and then often die in the process. So if you have, if you know of when you have a pimple or an infected cut and you have pus, that pus is actually dead white blood cells that have you know, sacrifice their life in trying to keep you well. The third line of defense is much more specific and takes a much longer time to um, warrant its or mount its attack. So all cells have markers on their membrane. The immune system recognizes your own cells, mostly. Sometimes the autoimmune disorders, your immune system gets confused. But the immune system recognizes the body cells and doesn't produce antibodies to fight those cells off. The markers on invading cells are recognized as antigens or antibody generators. And the immune system causes antibodies to be made against them. This takes many steps, however. I threw this diagram in from Cognity just to show you that there are lots of different immune cells. So macrophages are special white blood cells that go around and gobble up the invaders. Um, B cells, helper T cells, memory T cells, and cytotoxic T cells and plasma cells are all involved in your immune function. So places where immune functions are involved in your bone marrow, your spleen, your lymph nodes, and your thymus. So we have two different types of white blood cells called leukocytes. Phagocytes, or macrophages, ingest bacteria by the process of endocytosis. You can see that they actually can extend their cytoplasm and engulf the invader and then digest it. Lymphocytes produce antibodies. So the first one, they're not very specific. The second one, more specific. So antibodies, they're proteins special proteins, and they're actually made of multiple proteins altogether. Um, they recognize and bind to specific antigens. And remember, antigens are foreign substances that stimulate the production of antibodies. So your, our immune system recognizes them as other and then start creating antibodies against them. Many of the molecules on the surfaces of viruses and bacteria are antigens. This is from our cognitive book. Um, of this is what an antibody would look like. One thing that you are required to do for your IV exam is to take a look at um, antigens and blood transfusion. So you're to re read the passage and summarize the impact of receiving the wrong blood transfusion. In that section, you'll see this. So you don't want agglutination. That's when your blood cells clump together and that's bad because you could develop clots and die. That's not good. And then these are all the different combinations. And you'll see if you receive type O blood, you're not going to have agglutination. So you're going to be okay. Otherwise, if you're, so O is considered the universal donor. A, B is considered the universal acceptor because it has all the antigens present. So the A antigen and the B antigen. So basically you can receive any type of, of, um, blood 
So if you're type AB, you don't make antibodies to A or B. If you're O, you make antibodies for everything. So you actually can only receive type O blood because you'll create agglutination if you receive any of the other types of blood. So for the next little bit of time, we're going to talk about the production of antibodies. So the first thing that happens is a macrophage will um, ingest a pathogen and then present its antigen onto its cell surface. And when that happens, it will activate a helper T cell. And then the helper T cell will present that antigen to a B cell and activate it. The B cell will make the antibodies, make a lot of clones of itself, and then produce plasma cells, which are the cells that produce a lot of antibodies. Or it'll, some of those plasma cells will become memory cells, which will linger in our immune system, in our bone marrow, be ready for that presentation of that same antigen again. So that it'll be ready to fight off an infection if we were exposed to it again. So now we'll talk about the different steps. So step one, antigen presentation. So macrophages will take in the antigen by endocytosis. It'll present or process the antigen and attach it to a membrane protein called an MHC protein. That part isn't as necessary for you to remember. But the macrophage ingests and then presents the antigen on its surface. It will then send a signal to activate a helper T cell. So the helper T cell binds to the macrophage that's presenting the antigen and then gets signaled to be activated. Step three is when the B lymphocytes are activated. So B cells have antibodies in their cell surface membranes. And the antigens bind to the antibodies in the surface membranes of the B cells. So the activated helper T cell with the receptors for the same antigen bind to the B cell. And then the helper T cell sends a signal to the B cell activating it. And then the activated B cell starts to divide by mitosis to form a clone of plasma cells. Plasma cells are activated B cells with a very extensive endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, so it can build proteins because of the ribosomes and then transport them. So the plasma cells can build large quantities of antibodies, which they then excrete by exocytosis. And then your immune system is ready to send those antibodies everywhere to attack the invaders. Now, the secondary response are our memory cells. So if an antigen invades your body a second time, a much faster response happens, which produces larger quantities of the required antibody. So when the activated B cells are dividing during that primary response, some of them stop div dividing and stop secreting their antibodies, and they become memory cells. And large numbers of memory cells can remain in the body for a long time and are able to produce large amounts of antibodies very quickly when they're stimulated. This diagram from our Cognitive textbook shows that primary and secondary response. So the first exposure to the antigen happens here at time zero. The primary response to antigen A takes quite a while, but then if you're exposed again, your response is extremely quickly and your antibody production remains elevated um, for quite a long period of time. So antibiotics are chemicals produced by microorganisms to kill or limit the growth of other microorganisms. They can kill prokaryotic cells, so bacteria, but don't harm us because our cells are eukaryotic. Bacterial infections can be fought, but viruses can't because um, viruses enter and take over the host cell. To, to kill the virus, you would have to actually attack the host cell as well, and that's a bit of a problem. So we've heard for a long period of time that Fleming is credited for the discovery of penicillin, but he never thought it would be useful in the body, nor did he think we could ever commercially make it. But Florian Chain are two scientists that were responsible for developing a medical treatment, a mass-produced medical treatment of penicillin. So histamine and allergies. So white blood cells release histamine in response to allergens, and they cause your capillaries in the affected area to dilate and become leaky, 
which is why you end up with those symptoms of allergic reactions. So itching, fluid buildup, sneezing, mucus, and inflammation. And rashes and anaphylaxis or severe swelling can occur as well. So allergens aren't pathogens, but our immune system responds, I guess, inappropriately to those pathogens or allergens. So one thing that we can also do is produce what are known as monoclonal antibodies. So we make those commercially. So the antigen that corresponds to the desired antibody are injected into an animal. Then the B cells that are producing the antibody are extracted. Those B cells are fused with a tumor cell to produce what's called a hybridoma, which makes a lot of antibodies very quickly. The antibody is extracted from the hybridoma cells, and then they can be used in um, tests, so to check for a particular antigen. So they can be used in pregnancy tests um, to, to detect the, the pregnancy hormone that's first produced, the HCG. Um, they can be used in drug tests to find out if you have ingested a certain drug um, they can also be used in COVID-19 rapid tests. So those rapid antigen tests are seeking for the, the antigen, the spike protein, basically, on the COVID-19 virus. So this is what a pregnancy or pretty much any um, test that does this looks like. So there is a few things. So in a pregnancy test, you pee on the stick. So the Reaction site is where you pee. If you're using a rapid antigen test, that's where you take the extract from your swab and put it onto the reaction site. Um, on the reaction site, there are free antibodies. So for a pregnancy test, it trapped um, the HCG, the, the initial pregnancy hormone, and then a dye enzyme. Then in the test site, there are fixed antibodies and the dye substrate. And then in the, the control site, there is a fixed antibody that traps the free antibodies and the dye substrate. So basically the free antibodies are used to make sure that the actual test is working in the control site. So you, you should get a band in the control site. If you don't, then there's something wrong. Um, in the test site, that's the first band. If something shows up there, um, then you are testing positive for pregnancy or COVID-19 or so on. So active versus passive immunity. So active immunity is when you make your own antibodies after being exposed to the pathogen. And that takes time to develop. And that's considered natural immunity. Passive immunity is when the organism acquires the antibodies from out, outside source. So sometimes you may have heard of some antibody therapies where you actually receive somebody else's antibodies to help you fight the disease. That happened in the early stages of COVID, um, trying to do take the plasma from people who had already recovered from COVID to see if their antibodies would help reduce the illness of someone else's. Um, passive immunity also happens through a mother's um, placenta, antibodies cross the placenta, and also passes through the colostrum, which is a very fat and antibody-rich um, substance that's produced before the mother's um, milk comes in, after the first couple of days after birth. The effect of passive immunity is immediate, but it's also called artificial immunity because you didn't make it. So why do we vaccinate? Well, it's to help prevent disease. So the very first vaccine that was produced was the one for smallpox. It's often been credited with um, Edward Jenner, but if you watch the untold story of the first vaccine from SciShow, you'll find out that that story is much muddier than uh, what Jenner, this, uh, he's not as big a hero and he's not the first person to create an inoculation against smallpox. What vaccines do is they can expose someone to the dead or weakened pathogen, a related pathogen that doesn't cause illness, or other methods. And so when you're exposed to those pathogens or antigens, um, you'll produce memory cells against the pathogen. 
We usually only vaccinate against dangerous illnesses, so polio, measles, smallpox, and COVID-19. If the person is exposed to the real pathogen, they'll produce a quick response and most likely will not become ill. Doesn't mean that you're not exposed or infected by the pathogen, it's just your immune system will fight much more quickly because of those memory cells that you made from the vaccination. So zoonosis are pathogens that can cross the species barrier. So some examples are Ebola, so that the origin was from monkeys or fruit bats. COVID-19, the origins were bats. Avian flu, H5N1 were birds. Swine flu, I, there's a typo there, H1N1, it's from pigs. These viruses mutate to allow human-to-human -human transmission as well, and that's where it gets concerning. So animal-to-human transmission can happen rarely, and then if there's a mutation to cause further transmission from human to human, that's where things get really tricky. So epidemiology it look, takes a look at contact tracing. So basically to figure out if you've been exposed to a virus. Um, and that can be very hard to do because people are often infectious before they have symptoms. So in the days of COVID, we learned about, you know, super spreader events where one person would show up somewhere, infect a whole bunch of people, then those people would go somewhere else. And before they knew that they were sick, they infected more people and so on. So um, this happened in sporting events, um, university areas, and so on. So one virus that is... Um, in our syllabus is AIDS, so Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. It's, not, it's the syndrome that's caused by a virus. So it's caused by HIV or the Human Immunodeficiency Virus. The virus attacks your T lymphocytes. So eventually your body is unable to reduce antibodies because the lymphocytes don't get activated, so they can't activate the B cells to make the antibodies. So over time, as the virus takes its toll on the T lymphocytes, the person will be unable to fight the simplest illnesses, which will ultimately lead to their death. So HIV can't live long outside the body. It can't easily pass through the skin, so it can't be transmitted through touch, unlike what people thought at the beginning. Again, they didn't know how it was being transmitted. It has to be transmitted through bodily fluids from infected person to uninfected person. So through unprotected sex, through sharing needles, through um, in the early stages before we knew about HIV, um, their blood products were um, caused transmission because we didn't screen for HIV. And we've actually been able to reduce the amount of transmission from an infected mother to her fetus as well through um, modern science. So what happens if we damage one of our blood vessels? Well, we will form a semi-solid clot from liquid blood. And why? Because we want to stop blood flow. Blood carries so many materials and our blood pressure needs to be maintained. So we also want to seal off an open vessel to prevent the entry of pathogens. So there are three different processes that happen when a vessel becomes damaged. There's vasoconstriction, the formation of a platelet plug, and the formation of a blood clot. So the first step, what are platelets? Remember, they're the cell fragments that circulate around the blood with red blood cells and white blood cells in the plasma. Step one, vasoconstriction. This will help slow flow, blood flow and help reduce blood loss. So basically, the blood vessels that are affected will constrict, narrow, so not as much blood will travel through that vessel. So it'll prevent the loss of blood. The second step is that there will be a platelet plug form. So when the vessel is damaged, collagen fibers will get exposed and platelets are attracted to the collagen. So they become activated and it makes more platelets want to aggregate at the site. So it'll form a plug. And then we will start making a clot. So clotting factors will be released from either the damaged tissue cells or the platelets. The clotting factors set up a series of reactions where the product of the first reaction is the catalyst for the next. 
And this happens for two reasons. One, to make sure the clot only forms when you need one and to enable a very rapid response. You don't need to know all of the steps because um, they're not necessary for you to know. However, you do need to know the last stage of the reaction. So in the last stage, fibrinogen, which is a soluble plasma protein, gets converted to insoluble fibrin by the molecule thrombin. And this forms a mesh that will catch even more platelets. So you can see what's happened here. So there's your damaged blood vessel. There's clotting factors that have been released. Prothrombin activates thrombin, which activates fibrinogen, which then creates the insoluble fibrin. And then you end up with your blood clot. Now there are times when blood clots are not a good thing, and that happens in coronary thrombosis. So remember, your coronary arteries supply blood to your heart. If a blood clot forms in the coronary arteries, you can end up with a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And remember, atherosclerosis from last year. So the walls of the arteries can become hardened and arteries get blocked or occluded by cholesterol deposits. And these plaques can rupture and they can cause plaques to form. So if some of those blood vessels get damaged, those coronary arteries, that muscle in that area will die and then your heart won't be able to function in the same degree.